and welcome. Adelina, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our session. Uh, it's our first time speaking at Container Days and our first time in Hamburg as well, so we're really, really excited. So today we'll be talking a little bit about communication between microservices. It is a very important part of your microservice architecture and it often doesn't get its own session or its, or its own kind of dedicated discussion. So I'm Adelina, and I'm a technology evangelist at Form3, and I have a background as a back-end engineer, so this viewpoint, you will see this viewpoint throughout my talk. And I'm Artur, I'm senior software engineer at Form3, and I do Go. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yay, Go, exactly. Let's go with it, sorry. Yeah. This will also explain why we have a multitude of gophers throughout yeah. our presentation. Go is indeed our language of choice. Um, so you will see some Go code today, but don't worry if you're not familiar with it. It will be just for demonstration purposes and we'll give you a gentle introduction. Okay, so today we're looking at the typical startup story. So a monolithic application is an application that is built and released as a single unit. And typically it's in one code base, but it can be divided into multiple repositories. How do you know if you're working in a monolithic application? Well, think about what's going to fall over in the case of a bad commit. If the answer is everything, then for sure you're working in a monolith. We're not disputing that the monolith is a logical starting point when you're first building out an application. While microservices are relatively simple to start up, it is diffi the difficult part is actually establishing your communication and your application boundaries, especially when your requirements change, as is the case for a typical startup story. So what are typical tech stack choices for startups? Tech stack, the typical tech stacks give us the opportunity to reduce cognitive overload by not having to make our own technical choices. So it all began with a LAMP. And the LAMP stack is known as LAMP because it runs Linux as an operating service, Apache as the HTTP server, MySQL as the database, and PHP as both the front end and the back end. So a little fun fact for you, the LAMP acronym was, um, was first f established by Michael Kunze in Computer Technique um, publication, which is here in Germany. So I thought I would give a shout out. And this was in 1998. Now, it was one of the first um, stacks that was open source and it was easy to deploy because we can deploy Linux on a variety of different hardware options. But it does lack flexibility because it's not built for cloud and as we continue to scale, we run into scalability issues with both Apache and MySQL. Then we have the mean stack, and this was um, actually coined as an acronym in, in about 2013. And it's called mean because it uses MongoDB as a database, it uses Express as the web, web server, and Node, and this ability to write both, uh, oh, and Angular as the front end library. And this ability to write JavaScript throughout the front end and the back end allows people to actually use one language throughout. So that that was a huge plus. However, MongoDB doesn't have asset compliance, and um, it, people, when they were running it in production, they did see that it can be unpredictable during heavy workloads. And also, people did see that there were sometimes there were data that was dropped from Mongo, so um, it wasn't the silver bullet that it, it was supposed to be for everything you were going to build. Also, this is not my expertise, but from my understanding, Angular was, did not age well. There were, some de there were some design decisions that were made that the community wasn't keen on. So now we talk about Jam, the Jam stack. And this is known as Jam because it runs JavaScript in a thick web client. And then you have this mysterious APIs box. And all of the sites are in a static, statically generated HTML, which make up the markup box. 
Now this is kind of looks like we kind of gave up on defining a stack. It doesn't have any prescriptive operating system. Even the JavaScript library it is not prescribed. It says we could use React, we could use Vue, or even Angular if we wanted. But it's more a thinking and a way that we build applications, then that's why the Jamstack was, became popular. And it can be perceived that dynamic features are difficult to add in the Jamstack. However, we will see that this is not the case if we get our inter-service communication correct. So if we peek into the API black box, we see that we have a variety of goodies that can actually help you build all of the complex behavior that you want in your system. We've got backend services, which can be serverless, or they can be deployed in whatever cloud you want. You've got a variety of databases, and I've put some logos here in case you're not familiar with them. We've got Postgres, we've got DynamoDB, then we have Firebase and so on and so forth. And we also have third-party services for whatever you want, if you want search, if you want notifications or authentications. And the API black box is kind of, it's given a nod in the jam stack, but it allows, it's up to us how we want to communicate with it. Now, what we really need from modern system, let's, let's think about it. We are now mature system architects. We've, you know, we've like gone on to build these amazing products. But what we really need, or our users really need, is availability, even during upgrades, scalability as we become obsessed with the newest product, and of course, data flexibility. As engineers, we want to have access to a rich amount of data and process it however we want according to our new requirements. And finally, we want efficiency, and not only on transactional, but also analytical queries. If you think about it, we're now used to ranking systems, we're used to recommendations, and these are all analytical queries that we need to run very quick. And no single stack can handle that, but a well-designed microservice architecture can, and today we'll be looking at exactly that. However, the glue that I alluded to in my intro is the, the, the communication patterns. And today we'll be looking at REST APIs, gRPC, and event buses. So I'll now hand over to Arthur, who will tell you more about them. Thank you very much. So we know that we will have REST, we'll have gRPC, we'll have event buses. Let's talk a bit about them. So, Normally, you would start with RESTful APIs. Representational state transfers is really hard. Let's stick to REST. So it's basically an API that goes with stateless resources, so to speak. So everything, well, you just expose an endpoint, and the endpoint does something. Right? And you can go with the front-end applications. You can go with the back-end applications. For the sake of our talk, we'll be talking about the microservices. So this is where I will be touching on. So everything is delivered via HTTP. It goes back and forth. Then usually it goes with JSON. And we will talk about that in a second, because with gRPC and JSON, do you really need it? No, you don't, so yeah. Um, and then for the actual handler bit, for, for the actual request, well, you can't just shoot a request and then expect the response, because well, if, you call, if I call Adelina and say, give me something, and Adelina will go, but what? Yeah, so you need headers, you need parameters, you need URLs and HTTP methods so your server understands, well, what's going on. In our case, we don't have really a server, we have one microservice and the another microservice, and they have to talk to each other. So then we go into GraphQL, which was sold as a snake oil a bit, if you didn't understand what it was. Basically, it's RESTful APIs with some cream and cherries on top because what it does, it exposes one endpoint, and then you can query and fetch it from it. For example, one of the biggest usage, uh, one of the biggest users of GraphQL is, uh, what it was called? The very big reverb.com. If you're into music, there's a very big website which goes across the world right now. What they have, they have really one endpoint, and GraphQLing everything, doesn't matter if that's users or whatever. Within microservices, does it really work? Well, you have to answer it yourself, basically. 
And then we go with gRPC. So this is a framework that was set up with CNCF. And this is remote procedure calls. And the G stands for Google, because they've started working on the whole framework. How can you think about it is basically doing a local calls within your code, so using it as a function. And you don't have to define really anything, which is not true, because you generate the service, which we'll see in a second, um, and then you make the calls. What gRPC gives us is that we have both synchronous and asynchronous applications. We can do push, we can do fetch, we can do basically whatever we want. Underneath, it works on HTTP slash two, which, is, which has been actually taken out of many browsers. So for the front end applications, it doesn't really work, but we don't care about that. And then we have event buses. So the event buses is like prime microservices communication, because what we do, we take a message, and then the message goes here, and then whatever happens here, well, we don't care. We just slap the message. It will be picked up by someone someday, somehow, depending on the queue you will be using. So we send the message to the broker, and then the broker is distributing your message across your microservices stack, depending on the PubSub system you will have, because maybe you will have many listeners on one queue, or maybe you will have one queue for anything, or maybe multiple queues, so it's up to you. So the good thing is that my slide hasn't updated. Oh, it's got this. Yeah. Now it's good. So most third-party services offer REST and gRPC integrations. So if you have your Postgres database, you can both do the super nice long connection string that we all know and love, or you can do gRPC underneath, which makes it even faster. So the demo, the all we've all been waiting for. So there has to be a few things said before we start. Every benchmark we did was done locally. We haven't containerized it for a reason, because so when you containerize it, it works even better. But we wanted to show you on the like, bare bones how would it work. So we have a, can you see that well? No, yes, bigger, smaller. Perfect. That's good? Yeah. Cool, good stuff. OK, so what we have is a really easy application, and I will start with the types. So types. So this is the struct that we will be working in and out. So I couldn't think about good idea, so we have a human. So we'll get a human, and we'll create a human, playing God, basically. So we have a first name, last name, age, and does he like pizza? For def by default, if we're creating a human, we can set that flag to true. There's no other option. And then you have the idea of the human. So that's the thing. Bam, 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 bam. Let's go to the rest word. Or west word. So many bad puns. So if you're into Go, then you will understand it. If you're not into Go, let me introduce you to Go. This is Go. This is people, people, this is go. So we have a first handler, which is to create a human. And what we have from line 16, well, we define the struct that will hold a human. And then we do the JSON decoding. Uh, if you remember, like, I don't know, five minutes back, I'll tell you that we'll touch on this. So in the REST API world, you kind of have to think about getting them into nice structured way, which is JSON. So this will also affect our benchmark, because as you will see in gRPC world, we don't have to do it. So we decode the human into JSON. If it fails, then we go, sorry, you can't do it. As you can see from line 24, this is a super smart way of generating IDs for the humans. So we have a map, which is our database in this case. And then we just add another one. Sorry, not sorry. And then we go, OK, human has been created, toodaloo, all, all good, all roses. Another, or the, like the second handler, which is to get human. So we will be using query params in our REST, a, REST API. So we get the human, we get the ID of the human, we go with our super nice implementation line 51 of the database, which is basically look into that map and find me a human with that ID. 
and then, well, we return the human. Yeah. So what we did later on, um, we've run the tests locally. We have a local server that has been created in test.go. So as you can see, we're opening the TCP connection. We create the server. We do some funky stuff with the listeners. We create the transport. I'm, I'm just touching on the important bits. If you want to talk Go, we're at the form free booth, and I can walk you through. I'm happy to go about this in detail. Thank you. I was, I was fishing from that. So as you can see, for the whole benchmark, we create as many humans as possible. I will touch on benchmarking Go in a second. Then we marshalize it into JSON. Then we post that JSON into our API. And we want to have a proper code. We want to see that the human has been created. Then, as you can see, this is really bad Go code, but it serves a purpose. So on line 68, we set up our database of humans. Bad. Then for 500,000 humans, we are getting, uh, we are sitting in the database to, to have it nicely working. And then for the benchmarking of get humans, we do exactly the same bit, which is as you can see, we are calling the REST API endpoint with a query param to fetch the given human. And we just want to have a human and so many humans. So REST bit, that's all fine. The bad thing about REST APIs is that you have to do it yourself, and you have to be the maintainer of it throughout the application. So this is where gRPC comes into play, humans. And gRPC does a really smart thing, which is defining your types, and that's all. So if you remember the struct that we had, now we have a message, which is our human. So the human has an ID of type integer. It has first name, last name as a string. Again, the age as an integer. And the Boolean, if he likes pizza or not. But as we know, he likes. Or she likes. Doesn't matter. And then the great thing is that when you generate that code, you have two other files. So pb.go and grpc.pb.go. What this allows you to is right now, if you're writing Java, or you're writing C Sharp, or you're writing the best language in the world, which is Go, or you're writing the best, worst language, which is JavaScript, or TypeScript, you can do whatever. So if you have one microservice that is written in Go, another in TypeScript, and another in, I don't know if PHP allows you to do gRPC, but let's assume it does, then you don't have to worry about that serializing, deserializing bit, and wondering if the contract between your microservices is set properly, you can just plug and play. So there's still a bit of work involved into that bit. So we still have to define the methods to both get human and create a human. But that, as you can see, it's way easier. You don't have to worry about marshalling JSON. And has anyone been playing GTA 5 for the last eight years? <laughs> yeah, that's a simple thank you. So in GTA Online, there has been an issue with marshalling and unmarshalling JSON. So like if you're loading into your online session, the reason why it takes so long is because they have to marshalize a really, really big JSON. If they would do this, they wouldn't have to, but then <laughs> Rockstar. So what they actually did, they've changed the engine then in which they serialize, deserialize. Well, we don't have to do that. Right? So we have get human. So this is my small implementation of, OK, let's serialize something into something. So we get our type into human and human into type. And I've been talking way too long, so please find me, and we'll talk about Go. So the benchmarking. OK, so on your left, yes, on your left, my right, you have get human as operation per test duration. We've run the test for a given amount of time. And then you have time per operation. On your left hand side, the, le the more operations you have, the better. And the get human time per operation, the less time you have, the better. 
given that it was run on the local machine, well, you can see that there has been, well, like, four times faster on gRPC world. If you move it into containers, it's around 10 times faster. And the same goes for creating a human, which is, well, to create a human, you don't have as many operations as you would have on the gRPC end, and vice versa. The time per operation takes way more on the REST end than on gRPC end. And we can talk about serializing, deserializing JSON there, but, well, you still have to work with that. So, REST versus gRPC. Let's go with the pros and cons, if you haven't already taken out from my uh, small thingy. So, the pros on the REST end is, well, it's easy to use. You don't have to go through such an overhead to learn that. It's flexible and it's universally support, which we've seen is the case in gRPC world as well. The con is, well, <laughs> no native code generation. You can use Swagger, you can use other tools to generate the code for you, but natively you don't have a set tool to do that. You have multiple requests required to fetch one resource, or if you want to have more options to fetch them, well, one endpoint to fetch one person, one endpoint to fetch bulk of person, pagination, etc. And also it's only as good as the design is. Whereas with gRPC we have strongly typed, everything, it's lightweight and it's high performance, as you've seen. The con is it has a really long brow low browser support. It's not really human readable. If you're not a programmer, well, it's a bit hard to read that, and it has a very steep learning curve. So go back to REST APIs, because this is what we do. If you're into software engineering, well, we mostly write APIs, and there's no way to deny that. So how to make them nicely? Use the content type headers. Use nouns for your endpoints. Make them human readable. Nest logically all the resources that you have. Handle error with standard codes. Don't introduce a code of 999,999. I think that's Final Fantasy Max damage. Don't do that. Use filtering, use sorting, use pagination for your endpoints. And use semantic versioning to mitigate breaking changes. If you're introducing a new version of the API, don't just go, Here's a new API in s'il vous plaît. Just go, okay, there's a version two, there's a version three. Make your users use your API with the best intentions that you can. Also, if we go into decomposing the monolith, have a good reason for that. Not all monoliths are bad, although we've been told that they are. Have a good reason. So, with the microservices, well, get a micro, microservice. If you have a microservice that does more than one thing, is it micro? Keep them separated. So one microservices, again, does one thing. Have them compatible. Think about plug and playing your infrastructure as you go. Allow them to grow. Dockerize them, containerize them, Kubernetes them. I don't know. Make them communicate nicely. So think about how your communication will look in a year, in a month, in 10 years, if the code will be still alive don't make an overhead where you don't have to do. But wait a minute, we talked about event buses. What happened to them? Oh, I'm glad you asked, because I'm here to tell you. So communication, <laughs> event buses are um, a way that we can communicate between services, and it's all about communicating in a scalable way, and it allows you to scale the different parts of your system as you need it. So here are some of the technologies that you will often encounter when you're talking about event buses. So you've got Kafka and Amazon SQS, which are, are, have pull cons cons message consumption. So the subscriber needs to pull messages. That means you're in control of how quickly you are actually consuming these messages. And that's something important to keep in mind. Then you have push event buses, and Redis and SNS and RabbitMQ are such event buses. And then you also have NATs and Cloud Pub Sub, which allow you to both pull and push according to what you want. So well, I've made some comparisons here because what's most important to understand is the limits of each of these things. And Amazon SQS comes in two flavors. So you've got standard, which gives you at least once delivery guarantees, and FIFO, which gives you in order exactly once. But the catch is that in FIFO, you can actually have only 300 transactions per second. So that's something, there's no such thing as a free lunch. 
Um, Google Cloud Pub Sub gives you at least once delivery guarantees, and you can also see the max payloads and max messages in queue. I'm not going to go through those. When it comes to RabbitMQ, Apache, Kafka, and NATS, we're comparing the features of the libraries, not any managed services. So because of the architecture of RabbitMQ, you can have, they give at least once delivery guarantee. And what's interesting to note here is that RabbitMQ doesn't have any max payload limit. Older versions did have a one megabyte, but the newer versions have no limit, which is actually really cool. And when it comes to Kafka, we know that messages are organized by topic, and um, messages are ordered within a partition. So like topics are then further divided into partitions. Th ordering is not throughout the whole topic, but within the partition, and that can have repercussions to how you architect your system. And finally, we have NATS, which Core, core, it also comes in two flavors. So you've got core NATS, which gives you at most once message delivery, and Jetstream, which has message persistent. Persistence gives you exactly once. And remember to architect according to the delivery guarantees that your system requires. You can use different technologies. Um, and also what's interesting to note is that you can also um, mix around between the push and pull message, message consumption. So what do we use in Form 3? It's all fun and games until it goes to production, right? So we actually have a hybrid cloud architecture, and you, we use NATS as our event bus. And our multi-cloud clusters are, are registered as leaves to the FPS cluster, which you see here in our data centers. And together, they form a super cluster, which is what, we, what it is called in NATS terminology. We can talk more about NATS after the talk at our booth if you want. Um, internally, we use REST for our inter-service communication, and we also expose a top-level REST API that our clients can integrate with. So that's kind of it for what we do at Form 3. So we can leave you with a couple of great conclusions. So first off, you need to declare war on your monolith and decompose everything. So that's not true. We want you to safely decompose your monolith and version your APIs and also um, use the good advice that Arthur gave you when it comes to designing your REST APIs. Also remember to make your system as complex and as expensive as possible. Talk to Rockstar Games, but well, not really. Come talk to us. And choose your microservices and their communication patterns mindfully. Just to fix one thing, we use event buses in our stack. Yeah. Yes, I know. I said not. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm just telling you. Um, also, use the shiniest tech possible that hasn't been battle tested and always throw away everything old. So that's also not true. Each communication pattern has its pros and cons. Think about your use case, and that is when knowing your requirements and what you're trying to do is important. And also, make absolutely everybody within your company use Vim, which we know is 100% true. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Um, you can find the podcast on tech podcast.formfree.tech. You can find our blog at formfree.tech slash engineering. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us in the booth, well, wherever you go. And with thank that. you for coming and to everyone yes. dialing in as well. Yes, and we do have some questions, so don't, nice. don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. Um, so we're going to yeah, switch to the questions here. Um, the first question has got four upvotes, so let's go with that. How does error or exception handling work in a gRPC setup? I, I had the same question because I saw that with the okay. JSON, it was, so it was kind of explicitly Basically, it works given. as good as you find it. So if we go to the server, right? So, bum, bum, bum. So, my case is not maybe the greatest, but you will understand where I'm at. So if we create the method to create a human, or like to get a human in that case, we pass the context in order to be able to, well, use the context to manage the handler. Then we get the input to the handler. And then what we have, we have the output, which is defined by the protocol buffer, and then we have the error. So the error handling is only as good as you define it to be. In our case, as you can see, the get human is super easy method because we have we only defined the human, so we return the error. 
or we haven't found the, or no, hold on. We haven't found the human, we return an error. We have found the human, we return the type of, well, protocol buffer and no error whatsoever. So if you want to extend the error handling, well, you have to do it yourself. Okay. I think that's the best explanation I can give. Cool, to. yeah, no worries, thank you. Um, next question, why is it even faster in containers? Is it due to virtual networking? Yes, so if you do it locally, um, depending on the system on which you are in, in case of Mac, um, there is only limited amount of requests you can send per port internally. If you do containers and you deploy it somewhere, well, you don't have that overhead. I can actually show you. So this is the live coding bit I didn't want to do. <laughs> so Let the record show you volunteered to do this. Exactly. <laughs> so create human will work, of course, because it's live coding. Let's go with the get. Please fail. Thank you. So we have a pre-set up port within our application. And then after a certain time, so for us it took half a second, um, the TCP connection goes, hey, you, you can't do that. Why are you abusing what I'm giving you? So then if you containerize it, well, you go outside of that realm because the communication doesn't happen within one container. It happens between the containers. Cool. We have uh, two questions that I, th I think cross over quite a lot, so we'll just ask both of them together. The first is, how do you avoid a distributed monolith when decomposing it? And the second is, how would you distinguish between microservices and a distributed mm. monolith? So where's the, where's the line? I okay. think... Uh, no, go, go. I'll go I and he'll go after. Yeah, nice. Um, so <laughs> I think it's all about how you distribute it, yeah. uh, how you divide the separation between your microservices. Mm -hmm. So they need to be, I have a specific thing that they do. And also he, um, Arthur covered quite well how to actually define your microservices. And it's all about having a set, are they able to, to work without impacting each other? Um, and the whole thing about the distributed monolith is if, even though you have multiple services, if they all fall over together, then they're a monolith. Yeah. And that was the key where I said it was like released and version together. Mm -hmm. What she said, basically. Okay. So is it a sandcastle or is it dominoes? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. good one. I didn't think about that. Um, all right. What about using async API? Well, it's still pressed underneath. Mm. So it is async, is it? Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. OK, cool. <laughs> Um, and this is not really a question, it's more a statement. Yeah. Uh, Open API or Swagger helps with type generation for REST API, even serves API for first purposes. Yeah, so we, we are aware of this, and uh, we understand that it like does code generation. Mm. We, he, uh, Arthur even mentioned that, but it's not like native code generation, which mm -hmm. is what we meant. It's with a native, GRPC. it doesn't work. <laughs> So you will have to pull in like an extra dependency yeah. in your deploy development flow. Yep, nice. All right, well, if there are no more questions, we'll go to second. I don't see anyone typing, so I think we're good. All right, uh, so thank you very much. Give a big round of applause, and uh, our next session will begin in 10 minutes. Thank you. Aww. Aww.